This is the second part of the lecture dealing with Chapter 2 in the textbook Ecology Concepts and Applications by Manuel Moles and Anna Shear from 2019, published by McGraw-Hill. Part 1 um, of Chapter 2 uh, is in a separate video, and hopefully you've already watched that, that lecture. And uh, now we're continuing on here. So in one, we had uh, dealt with the large scale patterns of climatic variation. We talked about how temperature, atmospheric circulation, and precipitation varied. We talked about how a climate diagram is structured and uh, how soil is the foundation of terrestrial biomes. Uh, today, in part two, we're going to be going over each of the biomes individually, and this is section 2.3 in the chapter. So the, um, what we'll start off with is a very quick review of the first part of the chapter, just in case it's been a while since you watched that uh, lecture. And then we will go over each of the following biomes, tropical forests, tropical savannas, deserts, woodlands and shrublands, which is also known as the chaparral or the Mediterranean woodland, um, temperate grasslands, temperate forests, the tundra, the mountaintops, and then I will touch on um, uh, some of the ways that the, that the biomes uh, or different ecosystems are structured in water. Chapter three covers life on wa in water. So I'm just gonna uh, just quickly review that and then the uh, homework section. So as a review, we did look at this biome map quite a few times and talked about these patterns of where we find these particular biomes. We talked about uh, how plants are extremely important um, and those plants have adapted to the conditions in those places. We went over how the uh, tilt of the earth and the earth's rotation around the sun results in the different seasons. And so when the sun was directly overhead, uh, we had a lot of energy being absorbed by the earth and heating up the atmosphere above the earth, causing the evaporation of water. So you get these areas um, when the sun is uh, directly overhead uh, between the, the Tropic of, of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. And uh, that would cause a heavy rainfall in those areas, but then that air was being pushed to the to the south and to the north up high. And as it dries, it condenses and cools and it sinks back down to the surface and you got these Hadley cells. And we talked about these Hadley cells and uh, also how they shifted up and down depending on where the sun is directly overhead at different times of the year. So that resu resulted in seeing some fairly clear bands of uh, tropical rainforest along the equator. We saw fairly clear bands of, of deserts where the, the cool, dry air was dropping um, back down onto the, the surface. And then uh, we also discussed things that uh, would uh, throw off these, these bands, these patterns, and uh, in, instead of seeing a nice clear uh, pattern all the way across, there were other complicating factors that were, were uh, resulting in other biomes uh, appearing within those areas of latitude. Biomes are distinguished mainly by the, the plants that are associated with the climate and the the seasonal variation in the climate is as important as the geographic variation. We went over what a climate diagram looks like with the temperature on one axis, y-axis, the precipitation on the other, and uh, temperature line is higher than the precipitation line. You, you had a drought. You did not have enough uh, rainfall to compensate for those temperature changes. Across the bottom, you had the different months uh, of the year and uh, the shading in the middle of this was showing you the uh, growing season in that particular location. So these would be average monthly rainfall and average monthly temperatures.
We talked about how mountains will have this rain shadow effect as the as the the water is being carried uh, off the ocean or a large lake. Uh, and it's being pushed up the mountainside. It'll condense the air as it cools and it's going to precipitate on that side. And by the time it gets to the other side of the mountain, the air has uh, dried out. So there's no moisture left and then um, it's cooled off. So it starts to uh, fall down that side and, uh, and you've got a desert on the rain shadow side. And we talked about soil. We also talked about how you have these uh, finer scale changes, variation over time and space, and talked about the Palmer Drought Index. So climate diagrams are really just looking at average conditions and one way we're measuring on um, a daily basis is uh, looking. So the um, what we'll start off with is a very quick review of the first part of the chapter, just in case it's been a while since you watched that uh, lecture. And then we will go over each of the following biomes, tropical forests, tropical savannas, deserts, woodlands and shrublands, which is also known as the chaparral or the Mediterranean woodland, um, temperate grasslands, temperate forests, the tundra, the mountaintops, and then I will touch on um, uh, some of the ways that the, that the biomes uh, or different ecosystems are structured in water. Chapter three covers life on wa in water. So I'm just going to uh, just quickly review that and then the uh, homework section. Smaller variation. So now we're ready to go into the biome section, which is section 2.3 of the textbook called Natural History and Geography of Biomes. And so now we know that the environmental conditions shape what each biome uh, is going to have living there. And uh, we're going to talk about the specifics of the climate, the soils and the organ organisms in each of the major biomes and then how those have been influenced by people. We talked about last time that uh, in the uh, early 1900s, uh, there was a lot of research on the structure of biomes. It was considered uh, important to understand how things work together in order to create a functional, sustainable system. We had this video the last time uh, as a brief introduction. And so I'm just going to play it again because I think it, it gives you a very good overview overview. Biomes are major communities of organisms that have a characteristic appearance and are distributed over a wide area defined largely by vegetation and regional variations in climate. Ecologists recognize between 8 and 14 major categories of biomes. The most commonly used terms to identify biomes include tropical rainforest, savanna, desert, temperate grassland, temperate deciduous forest, temperate evergreen forest, taiga, and tundra. Moisture and temperature are key environmental factors in determining which biomes are found where. Tropical rainforests receive 140 to 450 centimeters of rain per year and contain at least half of the Earth's species of plants and animals. The soil in tropical rainforests is not nutrient-rich. Most of the nutrients are held in the plants. Savannas are grasslands that border the tropics and receive 75 to 125 centimeters of rain per year. This environment is characterized by alternating rainy and dry seasons. Savannas are often inhabited by huge herds of grazing animals that migrate in response to the seasons. Deserts receive less than 25 centimeters of rain per year. Vegetation is sparse and survival depends on water conservation. Temperate grasslands are found halfway between the equator and the poles. These temperate regions are characterized by fertile soil. 
Temperate deciduous forests occur in regions with warm summers, cool winters, and plenty of rain. Dominant species of trees include oak, maple, ash, and hickory. Temperate evergreen forests occur in regions where winters are cold and there is a strong seasonal dry period. The taiga consists of a great ring of northern forests consisting of coniferous trees. This ecosystem is one of the largest on earth, with long cold winters and most of the limited precipitation falling in the summer. In the far north, above the taiga, few trees grow. The grassland, called tundra, is open, windswept, and often boggy. Trees are small and confined to regions near lakes and streams. Large grazing animals, including reindeer and caribou, as well as carnivores, such as wolves and foxes, live in these areas. So the... Um what we'll start off with is a very quick review of the first part of the chapter, just in case it's been a while since you watched that uh, lecture. And then we will go over each of the following biomes, tropical forests, tropical savannas, deserts, woodlands and shrublands, which is also known as the chaparral and the Mediterranean woodland, um, temperate grasslands, temperate forests, the tundra, the mountaintops, and then I will touch on um, uh, some of the ways that the, that the biomes uh, or different ecosystems are structured in water. Chapter three covers life on wa in water. So I'm just going to uh, just quickly review that and then the uh, homework section. We're going to start off with tropical forests. Tropical means we're talking about an equatorial uh, area. So we're talking about within 10 degrees latitude north and south of the equator. We're going to find these tropical rainforests. Average temperatures are around 25 degrees Celsius and they have uh, 12 hours of sunlight per day. The rainfall can be variable and that is going to determine whether you're going to get a tropical rainforest or a tropical dry forest. Um, and uh, we know that this is variable because we know those Hadley cells will shift depending on where the earth is in its orbit around. So types of tropical forests. There are thorn forests which are furthest from the equator. They have a very long dry season. There's tropical deciduous forests, and uh, they're a little bit closer to the equator. They do have a distinct wet and dry season, but they will lose their leaves during the dry season. And then there's the top tropical rainforest, which is what we usually think of when I think about tropical forests, we think about jungles. They have the large amount of, largest amount of rain of any biome over 250 centimeters of rain per year. So it's it's basically a constant uh, perpetual summer and there is an uninterrupted growing season. So there's no drought, you've just got unlimited all year round. So we'll talk about tropical rainforest because that's the one you're most uh, familiar They occur within 10 degrees latitude north and south of the equator. The temperature is fairly constant over the year. Uh, the annual rainfall of 2,000 to 4,000 millimeters, which is 200 to 400 centimeters, which is two to four meters, is relatively evenly distributed across the year. All of that rain tends to leach the nutrients from the rainforest soils and there's rapid decomposition because it's warm and uh, and so those those nutrients are released quite quickly as a result the rainforest soils are often nutrient poor they tend to be acidic they're thin and they don't have much organic material left it just gets recycled almost immediately so in many rainforests more nutrients are tied up in the trees in the tops of the trees than in the soils However, there are some places where the soils are very fertile, like along riverbanks, 
um, and you find that there is a, a lot of organisms living in those those soils that are recycling those nutrients quite quickly. Some of the organisms that live in soil include a lot of fungi. The fungi produce these hypha, which are these strands um, that uh, uh, spread out throughout the soil, gathering these nutrients. Um, a mat of these strands is called mycorrhiza, and what the trees will do, the plants will do, is they will work in conjunction with these fungi. So they will feed the fungi sugar that the plant produces through photosynthesis. The fungi will link up to the roots. They can either be on the surface of the roots or some of them even embed into the roots of the plants in order to provide the plants and nutrients from the soil. These mycorrhizae, these fungi are essential to the trees being able to grow in such a nutrient poor soil. Because of the uh, uh, rapid growth uh, you get these very large trees and this is definitely a very three-dimensional biome so the uh, organisms the plants add a third dimension you can be living in different layers up towards the sun and you're not like you're walking around on a flat uh, biome like in a grassland you have a lot of vertical dimension in the tropical rainforest one of the important things you should be aware of in tropical rainforests is that there are a lot of foods and medicines that are used for the world's uh, human populations. Unfortunately, because of that, it's become increasingly exploited for those products. The tropical rainforest contains as many species of plants and animals as all other types of ecosystems combined. Um, an example of a study that was done that they found in a four uh, mile square area that there were 750 different species of trees. That's a lot of different species of trees. And there were 1500 different species of flowering plants within that four square mile area. Typically, you'll see it, it uh, described as being stratified into different layers at, uh, based on the heights of the plants. Um, and uh, you, you might see this listed as, as five different layers. It depends on the type of the forest. Um, but each layer has its characteristic plants. Um, they could reach a height of 80 meters tall. When you get up really tall, you can find on the branches of the the trees, uh, these epiphyte mats. We talked about these in chapter one when we we're talking about nutrient budgets in forests, and they store a large amount of nutrients uh, and support a high diversity of plants and animals. So what happens is as leaves will die, a little insects will die, um, a, a soil starts to form um, on the surface of the, the branch, and that will help store and trap uh, organisms uh, such as bacteria and fungi that are going to go ahead and uh, recycle the nutrients uh, that have come off of these and uh, put those nutrients uh, back into the plants. The trees will even sometimes um, send roots up the trunk and back up onto the branches so they can take advantage of these epiphyte mats. These epiphytes are, are actually really popular now. People like to grow the, these are the little uh, air plants and little orchids and ferns and things like that. They're not parasites. They are just actually uh, using the, the tree for support. The location of the tropical rainforest, um, this is a, a moist environment, so we can uh, see that this is going to be where the sun has been directly overhead and it's evaporating all of that water, which was cooling and uh, condensing and falling in the form of precipitation. So we find this narrow band of, of tropical rainforest right along along the uh, equatorial region um, where the precipitation uh, in general exceeds a meter or, or sorry 10, 10 centimeters of, of uh, precipitation every month and so we end up over the course of the year getting meters worth of precipitation. Uh, the, the map shows the tropical rainforest in, in various locations 
um, in the biome. So we can see on the left side, we have the tropical rainforest uh, found in Brazil, where we have a very constant temperature throughout the year. And then the uh, precipitation is fairly constant depending on your location, but still is always adequate for, for growing your your plants. Then we've got a very similar pattern in Zaire in Central Africa. So, so we are looking once again at a very constant temperature. And then the last one is in Southeast Asia. We've got once again a very constant temperature. And uh, so you could look at a glance at these and you'd know that you were looking at uh, tropical rainforests. Uh, when we look at the amount of precipitation, just I point out that the scale um, changes where these turn into a, a darker blue in the graph. The scale goes from going up by 20 millimeters to going up by 200 millimeters at that point. So uh, if this scale was uh, set the same way all the way up, the, these graphs would be off the, off the page with the amount of precipitation. So there's very little topsoil. Uh, the soil is very poor. It's not holding many nutrients. It also is easily weathered, which means <clears throat> if you chop down the trees, it'll wash away in the rain. So it'll erode quite quickly. The subsoil tends to, uh, so we're down in the, the lower layers of the soil, tends to have uh, a lot of clay with iron in it. So it is a reddish soil. And so if they cut down the rainforest, you find these uh, exposed red soils washing away. And that is a major problem with the slash and burn type of agriculture. With slash and burn agriculture, you are going to be um, cutting down the trees and burning it in the hopes that those nutrients from the, from the burn will go into the soil, but it will wash away so quickly that it, you can only uh, farm on it for a couple of years and then it's gone. So deforestation, the cutting down of these trees is a major impact of humans in the tropical rain, rainforest. And uh, people are growing uh, corn, rice, bananas, sugarcane, sugar and getting approximately a quarter of our prescription drugs from plants. Uh, and unfortunately, um, it's also being uh, cleared for, for uh, cattle. The loss of forest at the present rate means that the disappearance of the forest is, is uh, within definitely within your lifetime. And uh, this is being ex uh, exacerbated by um, climate change. And uh, we're finding these forests are getting so hot, even the, the trees are dying from the increased temperature. And we are losing the uh, medical and economic values uh, of them. The next forest discussed in your book is um, the tropical dry forest, which is a seasonal forest. Uh, during the dry season, it is uh, all uh, looking a little brown. And then you can see in the, the top corner in the wet season, you have this beautiful uh, green forest where everything is is uh, flowering and the insects appear and animals will migrate in so that they can take advantage of that lush wet season. So it is a little bit further north and south than, than the tropical rainforest between 10 to 25 degrees latitude on the planet. So remember when we're talking about uh, latitude. We've got the planet sitting here. We've got the equator there. The equator's at, at zero degrees latitude. The North Pole is at 90. North, the South Pole is at 90. South, we got on its 23 and a half degree angle here. And so we had uh, between zero and 10, we had the tropical rainforest and 10 to 25, we will have the tropical dry forest. Because it's not raining all year round, the soils generally have uh, more nutrients, but they still are fragile. They're still vulnerable to eroding away. Uh, they have many of the same plants and animal species as the tropical rainforest. So you'll, you'll find uh, quite a bit of overlap in the types of organisms that live there. 
and this is much more heavily used by people. Uh, people will live here um, and clear it for agriculture because it's not raining all year long. They find it much more suitable for raising livestock. So when we look at the location of the tropical dry forest, we are surrounding that area. We had uh, in this area here in the middle of Africa and in Brazil and Southeast Asia, we had tropical rainforest. So it's surrounding that it's just to the north and south of those areas. When we look at the climate diagrams, they are completely different. So remember when you were looking at the climate diagram of the tropical rainforest, we still had this, uh, we have this, a jump in the scale so they've got um, very high amounts of rainfall but unlike the tropical rainforest that rainfall is not all year that rainfall is in a rainy season and so each one of these have a rainy season and uh, when that rainy season falls depends when the sun is directly overhead as it, it is uh, shifting uh, over the course of the year. So there is a, a fairly substantial part of the year where you do not have enough precipitation for the plants to grow. And so it's a very stressful time of year where you can see the temperature line falls above the precipitation line. So you have these drought, severe drought conditions at those times of the year. Uh, one thing to point out here, well, when we're looking at these tropical dry forests that are in Australia, so this one on the right hand side, that the months are different because they put their uh, summer in the middle. So this is starting at July and going to June is just starting at January to December like they do on the other ones. When we look at the types, different types of tropical forests, uh, we can see the human population density uh, varies quite a bit. Um, so the tropical dry forests are, are definitely where we have um, many more people. And because of that, they have been uh, uh, cleared and settled and, uh, and this loss of dry forest is significant. The, um, uh, even though there, there's more species in the tropical rainforest, we, we do have some dry tropical forest species that are found in no other biome that, that are being impacted and influenced. Uh, example of this may be uh, if you look at the tropical dry floor forest in Madagascar and uh, the species of lemurs are found only in Madagascar and they are definitely being encroaching, encroached upon. So the, um, what we'll start off with is a very quick review of the first part of the chapter, just in case it's been a while since you watched that uh, lecture. And then we will go over each of the following biomes, tropical forests, tropical savannas, deserts, woodlands and shrublands, which is also known as the chaparral or the Mediterranean woodland, um, temperate grasslands, temperate forests, the tundra, the mountaintops, and then I will touch on um, uh, some of the ways that the, that the biomes uh, or different ecosystems are structured in water. Chapter three covers life on wa in water. So I'm just gonna uh, just quickly review that and then the uh, homework section. The tropical savanna, this is like the land of the Lion King. Um, the savanna is uh, uh, found within uh, the areas between 10 to 20 degrees of the equator, which is uh, also where we're finding some of these tropical forests. So, so the differences between whether you're going to find tropical forests or, or tropical savannas is going to depend on some of these other factors, such as, as soils. So they occur north and south of the tropical dry forest within uh, 10 to 20 uh, degrees of the equator. So remember the tropical dry forest was uh, between uh, uh, 15 to 25 degrees of the equator. 
The climate, just like the tropical dry forest, alternates between a wet and a dry season. Um, when they have the dry seasons, uh, it often is associated with uh, at the beginning of the dry at the beginning of the rainy season. There's there's often thunderstorms, and you get the lightning, which causes the wildfires. So if you've watched The Lion King, which I think I think most of us have watched The Lion King, you're aware that the uh, the the savannas and the grasslands uh, will burn because uh, we see that happening when they battle scar. The soils have low water permeability, which means they hold the water on the surface. They have high amount of clay and uh, that causes the water to stay at the surface, which actually kills the roots of the trees. So uh, they are not going to be having very many trees. The landscape is definitely more two dimensional. They have uh, increasing pressure to produce livestock as well. So there's a strong human influence. So when we look at where we find the, the tropical savanna, we are once again, just moving a little bit further each time from the equator. Uh, so we've got this band, uh, just to the north and to the south of where the tropical dry forests are, north and south of the tropical dry forest. We have this band in Africa that is to the east of where we have the tropical rainforest. And this is uh, in part based on these clay soils, these heavy clay soils. And then uh, we also have, <clears throat> we can find tropical uh, savannas in places other than than Africa. So we obviously have them in South America. We find them in South Central Brazil, uh, Venezuela, Colombia. We also can find them in Asia and in India. And we can also find them across uh, Australia. When we look at the climate diagrams of these, we can see the very clear uh, indication of a very, very wet season. Um, so once again, we have this jump in the scale on these uh, climate diagrams. So we end up with a very wet season and then we have a, a drought. So we can see here in Venezuela, we have a, a summer wet season where the rainfall is much higher than needed. Um, then we have a short one uh, here uh, just on the edge of the Sahara Desert. We have a very short wet season. It's only two months long. And then here in Australia, we've got an even shorter wet season that's only um, a couple of months long as well. We can see in these different uh, subtropical savannas, the total amount of rainfall is very different uh, depending on how long their wet season is. Because of this changing of the seasons, you'll find that animals with both the tropical dry forest and the tropical savanna will often migrate uh, out of those areas during the dry season. So the savanna, they have generally a, a cooler dry period, a hotter dry period, and then that warm wet period. The frequent flyer, fires suppress the trees and it maintains a large population of grasses and forbs. Forbs are uh, plants that will uh, not get woody. They're not shrubs. They're not trees. So think of a dandelion as a forb. They're not grasses. So they're going to be broadleaf, but they're not grasses. Some of these are annuals that will just reseed and grow back every year. And some of these are going to be perennials like your dandelion that just uh, dies back during the dry season and then will uh, come back to life when it starts to rain again. So you get these uh, herbaceous, so these non-woody uh, plants, low growing annuals and perennials. Um, the grasses are, are monocots. They're, they're more recently evolved than many of the other uh, dicots. They have 
large numbers of herbivores that feed on these plants. So you get all this fresh green growth of grasses and forbs every year. This is beautiful pasture land. And uh, so you've got these large herds of, of herbivores. Uh, you get animals bur burrowing into it. So these are your most common types of animals that we have. So we have a picture here with giraffe and we have Thompson's gazelles, both from the African savannas. And obviously these animals are most active during the rainy season. Um, the giraffes will not migrate in the, in the dry season because they are feeding off these leaves of these trees. And so because they can find those little scattered trees across the savanna, uh, they don't have to follow the rains, but these little Thompson's gazelles will follow the, the rain patterns. One of the biggest threats to this uh, tropical savanna is that it is being used for domestic livestock. So these are cattle on the African savanna and uh, livestock grazing has had a huge impact around the world on the, uh, on the savannas. So uh, humans have always, uh, well, we evolved in, in the savanna area and so it's always been influenced by things that we, we do. We would use fire in order to help the grass grow and, and attract uh, herbivores then to come that we could hunt and use for food. Um, so this is when we lived in this just the savannas, we were hunter gatherers and we were able to also follow these rain patterns. But uh, now that we do sort of settled agriculture, uh, it means that uh, the density of the livestock puts a huge pressure on the land during the dry season. So when we uh, just reviewing where these biomes are again, so far we have covered the tropical uh, rainforest, which is in red, right along the equator here and here and across there and uh, a few little spots depending on the conditions a little further off from the equator. We have in purple, we have the tropical uh, dry forests that are next to those, lots of tropical dry forests in India. And then we have talked about the tropical savanna. So the savannas are next to the uh, rainforest or next to the tropical dry forest, depending on the soils. And we have these huge savannas across Africa. So the, um, what we'll start off with is a very quick review of the first part of the chapter, just in case it's been a while since you watched that uh, lecture. And then we will go over each of the following biomes, tropical forests, tropical savannas, deserts, woodlands and shrublands, which is also known as the chaparral or the Mediterranean woodland, um, temperate grasslands, temperate forests, the tundra, the mountaintops. And then I will touch on um, uh, some of the ways that the, that the biomes uh, or different ecosystems are structured in water. Chapter three covers life on wa in water. So I'm just gonna uh, just quickly review that and then the uh, homework section. So desert is a, a fairly sparse looking uh, landscape and uh, it tends to not have a lot of big trees or big things in the way. So the grasslands and the savannas and the deserts and the tundra, things without a lot of trees are going to be windy. And so you can see these sand dunes have been, the soil has been picked up and sorted into sand in different places and deposited by the wind and it gets sculpted into these, these beautiful patterns. But this is not what most of the desert looks like. Most of the desert um, has uh, plant life and animal life uh, throughout. Actually quite a bit of diversity in the desert. So we know we have major bands of deserts at 30 degrees north and south of the equator. And uh, we know why, because you know about Hadley cells and that uh, cool, drier air pushing forward down 
on the planet's surface. Deserts occupy about one-fifth, 20% of the Earth's land surface. So most of the Earth is, is water, but if we just look at the 30% of the Earth that is land, about 20% of that is desert. Water loss usually exceeds precipitation. So you have more water um, evaporating into the air than falling down onto the earth. The soil is extremely low in organic material. There's just not a lot of dead organic material lying on the surface of the soil. And the plant cover then tends to be spread out. It can be absent or it can be sparse. And that is because there's only a limited water. So you need to have enough space. The plants will outcompete each other if they're too close. The animal abundance is low, which means you don't have huge herds of things in the desert, but you have quite a variety of things. So you have uh, some, you can have high biodiversity, a lot of different types of species, but you don't necessarily have large populations of anything in the desert. The animals have very strong behavioral adaptations that allow them to live in the desert environment. When we talk about um, uh, water relations, we will talk a lot about these adaptations. Humans um, have been uh, spending more time in the desert. Uh, so so uh, humans had uh, originally uh, shifted away from living in desert areas because of the lack of water. But uh, now human populations who are able to control what we do have spent more time in the, in the desert area and, uh, and are tapping into the groundwater, which is a problem trying to maintain uh, water, sustainable water supply. When we look at the uh, deserts around the world, because they are such a harsh and difficult environment for things to live in, the things that live in them uh, tend to have ad adapted to, uh, or adopted the same strategies or survived if they have similar strategies. And this is showing you um, uh, the strategies of uh, two different plants from two different deserts. We've got um, on the left side, we've got a cactus in North America and on the right side we have a euphorbia in Africa and they they look like very similar types of plants but uh, they're actually unrelated so these are, have evolved the same traits um, but living in, in different continents. When we look once again at our distribution of the deserts, uh, we can see these bands at uh, 30 degrees, uh, approximately 30 degrees north and south of the equator. But uh, we also see these bands, remember we talked about those rain shadows of the mountains, we also see these bands in the rain shadows of the mountains. And so um, that's where the water had been uh, emptied out of the air after it had come from the oceans and pushed up the mountains. And then when you get on the other side of the mountains, you've got no water left. Uh, we can see uh, that the, uh, compared to the other biomes we've talked about, these have very low precipitation totals, 86 millimeters, 15 millimeters, 124 millimeters a year. Uh, in this uh, Yuma, Arizona, we can see that throughout the year, the, the uh, amount of rainfall line is always below the temperature line, which means there's never really adequate rainfall um, throughout the year. And then uh, here we have in Chad, we've got exactly the same problem. So they have basically a drought year round in the, the, the Arizona one and the Chad one. When we look at the Mongolia one, I showed you it, this particular climate diagram in the last lecture. And we could see that in the winter time, there is adequate rainfall, but at that time, the temperatures are below freezing. So this is a cold desert, which has a winter. And so at, at that time, all of that is frozen. All that rainfall is actually precipitation is, is frozen in the form of snow. So the only time they really have adequate water for, for plants to grow is going to be in the early spring when that all that snowpack melts. And then you get this uh, flush of things growing in the spring. 
the um, the spring the word for spring is vernal. Uh, try to get you the spell you the word here vernal. V e r n a l, and we talk call the spring um, equinox the day first day of spring the vernal equinox, and uh, so this is a vernal bloom of of plants a spring bloom of plants that you'll get in those cold deserts. So deserts are lands where evaporation exceeds rainfall. Evaporation rates can be 10, 7 to 50 times the population. True deserts have less than 10 inches of rain per year, which is 25 centimeters. Semi-deserts have 2 to 3 times that, but they still have high evaporation rates. They have very low humidity. Humidity is moisture in the air, and, and uh, air, water vapor in the air holds heat. It is actually a greenhouse gas. It's something that holds heat and warms up the air. Um, if you don't have any water in the air, then when the sun goes down, the nights get cold. There's no heat being held in the air. So they will have uh, very hot days, but very cold nights. And a lot of organisms time their uh, reproduction uh, to the rainfall events, which are infrequent, but usually uh, when they do get rainfall, it's usually a thunderstorm, it's something very heavy. When we look at the organisms that live in the desert, we can classify them by how they deal with the drought. And we can talk about the plants and animals as either being evaders, of drought or resistors to drought. So an example of an evader uh, would be a plant that survives through the drought uh, in the form of a seed. So they'll, during the wet season, they will uh, germinate and grow and reproduce. Uh, when there is like a thunderstorm, you'll see the desert will bloom and then uh, they will produce lots and lots of seeds that will sit in the soil and they could sit in the soil for years waiting for the next big rainstorm so they can go through the process again. Animals may hibernate if it's in a cold area or estivate if it's in a hot area, which means that they can dig down in burrows, they can go down in the mud under where the ponds were when it did rain, and they can just live down there uh, not really doing anything until they get another opportunity. So it's a dormancy during the dry period. Um, the picture here is a spadefoot toad, and when it rains, it emerges from the earth in order to uh, reproduce and then just crawls back down into the mud after it's reproduced and waits for the next rain. Um, birds will um, migrate, so they will come when there is ponds and when there's water and rainfall, and they will leave when, when there's none. Insects will um, uh, emerge when if there's rainfall and then disappear. Some things like plants can't come and go uh, if they're perennials, or they're sort of uh, left sitting there, and what they will do is uh, Plants will tend to grow deep roots where there's a lack of rain so that the, the root mass underground is going to get as deep as possible trying to tap into the groundwater. And that way they um, don't have to worry as much about whether it's raining out. Uh, then, and so you get these woody shrubs that, that are able to get re deep down into the into the soil. And you'll see a lot of succulents, uh, things like the cacti that have thick stems. When it does rain, they will swell up their stems to store the water. Some of the animals that are out there all the time, whether, whether it's a, a rain burst or not, have be behavioral adaptations. Uh, many are nocturnal. They only come out at night. And, uh, and so that's when it's cooler and so that they're not going to lose as much moisture. Some have physiological adaptations and they don't have to drink water. So the kangaroo rat has super kidneys and um, 
it gets whatever water it needs out of the seeds when you go through cellular respiration. One of the products of cellular respiration is going to, to be water. If you remember your, well, of course you remember your general biology, you had, um, you had glucose, which is C6H12O6, and you have oxygen, you go through cellular respiration, and you produce water and carbon dioxide. And so this water, this is a metabolic source of water. And they have super kidneys that will concentrate the urine so that they can get rid of waste without losing water and they produce little uh, crystals instead. So the um, what we'll start off with is a very quick review of the first part of the chapter, just in case it's been a while since you watched that uh, lecture. And then we will go over each of the following biomes, tropical forests, tropical savannas, deserts, woodlands and shrublands, which is also known as the chaparral or the Mediterranean woodland, um, temperate grasslands, temperate forests, the tundra, the mountaintops. And then I will touch on um, uh, some of the ways that the, that the biomes uh, or different ecosystems are structured in water. Chapter three covers life on wa in water, so I'm just going to uh, just quickly review that and then the uh, homework section. The next category, uh, the woodlands and shrublands, um, they are often called the Mediterranean woodlands and shrublands uh, because it's found within the Mediterranean, but these are also found in different regions and they're called different things in different places. Uh, we will often refer to it as the chaparral. We have it growing down in um, California, uh, in Southern California. Um, and uh, these are places with uh, oh, lovely weather where people like to live, like around the Mediterranean and Southern California. It's a woodland or a scrubland, which means it's not a thick, dense forest, it tends to have sparse trees. Mediterranean woodland and, and shrubland is found in all continents except for Antarctica. The climate is cool and moist in the fall, winter and spring and hot and dry in the summer. The soils tend to be fragile, which means um, that they, they are very erodible. So if you get a heavy rain, you're going to have landslides. And you find that in California. You hear about that when they have storms, they'll have landslides as well. But it has moderate fertility. You can grow things. This is where we put our vineyards. The trees and shrubs keep their leaves all year round. It's never so cold as to uh, require them to drop their leaves. Uh, it is a fire prone biome, which means that uh, you can count on fires coming through every uh, 20 years or so in, in an area. And so you always hear about fires in Southern California as well. Long history of people having lived here. We kind of love living in this particular uh, habitat. The um, open oak woodlands of southern Spain and Portugal have been uh, lived in for thousands of years uh, where they have um, grasses and, and, and the cattle will eat the grass. And then they have the oak trees and pigs will eat the acorns and then they harvest the oaks and the cork off of the oak trees. And then they can uh, plant wheat every now and again. And this system has allowed them to have sustainable agriculture for thousands of years within this uh, particular biome. Unfortunately, uh, in some places we clear the forests and uh, the soils, as I say, are erode away. This is a beautiful picture of some of the, the woodlands um, and shrublands. And uh, you can see how that the uh, fires will not become these big catastrophic fires in the crowns of the trees. A lot of the fires are just clearing the brush off of the ground and the litter off the ground. And, uh, and the trees have thick bark in order to prevent them from 
uh, burning up so they protect themselves with this thick bark so this is uh, looking at the bark of the uh, oak trees and uh, some of this bark is so thick that's where we get the cork from the cork oak uh, which uh, you use for the corks for your wine bottles So when we look at where we find this particular biome, then we can find some, uh, the biggest um, amount of it is going to be around the Mediterranean area, but we've got some down here uh, in the, uh, in, in Australia, we've got some in North America, which is, uh, from California and down into northern Mexico. There's found in uh, Chile and there's a little bit uh, found in New Zealand as well. And depending on where you live, it's going to be called different things. So in Western North America, it's called the Chaparral. Um, it's uh, called the Matarral in Spain. Uh, it's it's called the Finbos in South Africa. So I think the Australians call it the Mali. Uh, so it just depends on where you live as to what you're referring to it. When we look at the climate diagrams, then we can see in each one of them, we have the dry summer. So we've got the, the lack of rainfall in San Diego in the summertime, the lack of rainfall in Italy, uh, and then we've got the same thing in Adelaide, Australia. Remember in Australia, their summers are in December, January, February. So the, the months are adjusted. And then uh, we, we uh, total rainfall is uh, definitely higher than we found the total rainfalls in the deserts, but nothing even close to what we found in, in the, the tropics. And we are beyond the, the, the uh, limit of the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. So the Tropic of Cancer, um, the the biome is is north of that, and in the southern hemisphere, it's south of the Tropic of Capricorn. So the um, what we'll start off with is a very quick review of the first part of the chapter, just in case it's been a while since you watched that. Uh, lecture and then we will go over each of the following biomes tropical forests tropical savannas deserts woodlands and shrublands which is also known as the chaparral or the mediterranean woodland um, temperate grasslands temperate forests the tundra the mountaintops and then i will touch on um, uh, some of the ways that the, that the biomes uh, or different ecosystems are structured in water. Chapter three covers life on wa in water. So I'm just going to uh, just quickly review that and then the uh, homework section. Temperate grasslands. Temperate grasslands um, originally were these huge, vast areas of unbroken grassland where you have the big skies and uh, they were often referred to as prairies or plains, um, a sea of grass. Uh, they even, when they were going across North America, uh, they would call the little covered wagons, they would call those um, prairie schooners because uh, it's just like you're going across a sea of grass. This particular picture shows you North America's only antelope, and that is the pronghorn antelope uh, on the the grasslands uh, feeding that would be a short grass prairie in the west. They're similar to tropical savanna, but they're cooler, so they actually have a winter, so they get a cold season. Whenever you see the word temperate, you know you're going to be dealing with some sort of a cold season. So, so temperate refers to the fact that we're not tropical anymore, we are further north and south dealing with a colder season. Um, North America, we call them uh, prairies. In Russia, they're called the steppe. In Hungary, the huge grasslands in the middle of Hungary are called the pustas. In South America, it's called the pampas. In Africa, in South Africa, 
So when you get right down into South Africa, you start to go from a tropical grassland to a temperate grassland. It's called the veldt. It's a very successful biome, very widespread distribution. This biome is relatively recent. There were certainly not uh, temperate grasslands around in the time of the dinosaurs. Annual rainfall, 300 to 1,000 millimeters. So that's uh, 30 centimeters to a meter. They experience a periodic drought, which will limit how many trees will grow in the temperate grassland. The soils are amazing. The soils are extremely nutrient rich and very deep. They're thoroughly dominated by herbaceous vegetation. So vegetation that, that uh, dies back to the soil every winter. Um, so this is going to be your grasses and forbs. And there are herds of large roaming ungulates. So you have hoofed animals. Um, originally in the North American grasslands, those herds were millions of bison. Uh, we replaced them with cattle and didn't allow them to roam anymore. This was the original uh, large herds, uh, which had a huge impact on the grasslands. Um, so they were feeding on the, the grasses and the forbs. They were rolling on it, wallowing in it, uh, spreading seeds. Uh, so they had uh, these vast uh, migratory paths that they would take. The temperate grasslands at one time covered uh, about 42% of the world land surface. So remember, we talked about how the deserts uh, covered 20%. Temperate grasslands once covered 42%. Um, however, a lot of that has been converted to agricultural land. And you can see the little map in the corner shows the extent of the temperate grasslands, uh, the major parts of the temperate grasslands in North America much of which is obviously cultivated. They have these excellent deep soils. So uh, they produce um, a lot of plant material that dies back in the fall. And then the uh, soil organisms will reincorporate all of those nutrients down into the soil. And you have excellent soils, very rich. Unfortunately, the diversity is lost. Uh, we have replaced it with monocultures of one thing that you grow over acres and acres and acres where once there were thousands of different species. When we look at the global distribution of temperate grasslands, we have moved further north and south from the equator. Uh, and we can see that uh, these are temperate, which means that they do have a winter. So we have periods where the average temperatures um, in the winter time are below freezing. Uh, over here in uh, Manhattan, Kansas, which is uh, got this uh, three to four month winter season, and then the temperatures warm up in the summertime. Same thing in Russia, you've got this uh, relatively long winter season where uh, any precipitation in those seasons is going to be in, in the form of snow. And in China, the same thing. You've got this winter season as well. And then you have the, the rains tend to be a little bit seasonal, um, more falling in the summer than in the winter time. Uh, and these uh, rains, when it starts to get warm, tend to be accompanied with thunderstorms. So you tend to have uh, the thunderstorms coming uh, in the spring, which will start fires where burning off all the uh, all the dead grasses that had built up over the winter time. So you'll get a lot of thunderstorms there. And uh, here you can see uh, in some cases your your precipitation is not adequate, adequate enough and you end up with uh, a drought period. So there's very high rates of evaporation. There's periodic droughts. Rainfall um, is greater than that of the, the desert. It's, uh, it's 25 to 75 centimeters a year, whereas the desert is under 25 centimeters a year. But uh, the, the uh, rainfall is not strong enough for supporting forests, but definitely higher than you find in a 
Uh, grasses can be sod forming, like your lawn grasses, where it sends that little uh, tillers uh, side by side. So Kentucky bluegrass is a sod forming grass where you get this mass of, of uh, roots holding it all together. Uh, you also get these bunchy bunch grasses where they, they are spreading out of one central core area. So in the tall grass prairie, the bunch grasses, the major bunch grasses are big blue stem and little blue stem. The switch grass. The temperate grasslands um, have periodic fires, which are important for um, reducing the amount of litter on the soil surface so the plants can grow and it eliminates invading or incoming woody growth. So you're not gonna get uh, taken over with shrubs or trees because of the periodic natural fires. The animal life, just like the tropical grasslands, is dominated by grazing species and burrowing species. So here we can see in North America, we've got the uh, bison and we've got the, the prairie dogs. So the um, what we'll start off with is a very quick review of the first part of the chapter, just in case it's been a while since you watched that uh, lecture. And then we will go over each of the following biomes, tropical forests, tropical savannas, deserts, woodlands and shrublands, which is also known as the chaparral and the Mediterranean woodland, um, temperate grasslands, temperate forests, the tundra, the mountaintops, and then I will touch on um, uh, some of the ways that the, that the biomes uh, or different ecosystems are structured in water. Chapter three covers life on wa in water. So I'm just going to uh, just quickly review that and then the uh, homework section. Temperate forests. The Temperate forests um, definitely are where people move to uh, from the uh, grasslands uh, and the uh, temperate forests uh, really are are characterized by some of the um, oh, biggest cities around the world is where the temperate forests used to be. There are very few temperate forests left on the planet in their natural original. Most of them lie between 40 and 50 degrees latitude north of the equator. So remember the equator is um, at zero degrees latitude, 40 to 50 north we have temperate forests and there are a few temperate forests 40 to 50 degrees latitude south of the equator. Um, remember the North Pole is at 90 degrees and the South Pole 90 degrees south. Average rainfall higher than those grasslands, 650 to 3,000 millimeters. So you can have quite a bit of rainfall. And because the leaves fall off the trees um, and you've got adequate rainfall, uh, you tend to have very fertile soils. You get a long growing season uh, dominated by, uh, for, for a lot of these forests, by deciduous plants, plants that die back. Um, you might have a short growing season um, in some of the more northern temperate forests and uh, those forests are going to be dominated by conifers, things like pine and fir trees, spruce trees that don't lose their needles, don't lose their leaves. So depending on the length of your growing season is going to determine what type of temperate forest you have, whether they're deciduous, where they lose their leaves, or whether they're coniferous, or they keep their keep their needles, keep their leaves, and then that way they can uh, start photosynthesis as soon as it gets warm in the spring. The amount of biomass, the amount of plant growth, can be very high. It's a very productive area um, because of these fertile soils and this high biomass production. We've cut them. Forests, cut a lot of these forests down, especially the ones with the long growing seasons, and converted that to agricultural land. This is where you're going to find a lot of your big cities of the world is in the temperate forest. So you're going to find a huge amount of, of um, population. Tokyo, 
New York, London, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Toronto, Boston, Moscow, Berlin, Paris, all of these major cities uh, are where there was once temperate forests. Depending on where the temperate forest fall, fall, falls um, in the uh, rainfall areas, uh, we can find some of them uh, have much higher rainfalls, like in the Pacific Northwest, and those particular ones in the Pacific Northwest, so that's um, Washington State, uh, State of Oregon, and up into British Columbia, uh, you can find these uh, uh, much wetter uh, temperate rainforests in those areas. And uh, you can see this beautiful mossy temperate rainforest. So the temperate forests, you can see most of them are going to be in the northern hemisphere. So we have them um, all definitely north of the, the uh, Tropic of Cancer. So we're up in temperate areas. And then there are a small number uh, down here in Australia, New Zealand, and uh, the tip of South America, temperate forests. Um, we're looking at this forest in the Pacific Northwest I was talking about being the, the temperate rainforest. We can see very high levels of precipitation, rainforest levels of precipitation. Um, and then they have a very dry, dry summer. Uh, around here, so we're in New Jersey. We've got one here for, for Philadelphia. You can see fairly constant rainfall patterns um, all year and then seasonal changes in the climate where we have a winter period that is cold. Because of that cold winter period, the trees are going to lose their leaves so that they can uh, not lose water through the leaves during the cold time of the year. Um, and then once again, we're, we're down here in France. We, we have once again, we have a, a seasonal cold period where the trees have lost their leaves. But once again, um, in those areas, the uh, temperate deciduous forests tend to have uh, constant precipitation. So these were the temperate coniferous forests and the temperate deciduous forests uh, climate diagrams. The temperate deciduous forest then is in Eastern North America, Northern Europe. Um, and Eastern Europe, they have moderate temperatures, moderate moisture levels, which is why we like to live here, a five to six month season. And the trees will, at the end of that growing season, will start to remove nutrients from the leaves, take them down to the roots. And you see these beautiful displays of the uh, colors. These are the colors of the other um, pigments within the leaves. So the green pigments have been taken out. The green chlorophyll, and you're left with these anthocyanins in, in yellows and oranges and reds. Uh, the trees will drop these leaves. Um, which is an important source of nutrients to go into the soil. So the detritivores, the decomposers, will break these down and the trees can take the nutrients back up the next year from the soil. And uh, that way they're not hanging on to their leaves all winter. And so that if it's cold and, and the water's frozen, they're not trying to do photosynthesis and they're not going to be losing water out of the leaves uh, during the winter time. You'll notice that some of these trees in these pictures are evergreen trees, trees that are not going to lose their leaves. Uh, the further north the, you go, the more of these you're going to find until eventually it's all these uh, conifers with needles. The needle-like leaves um, have a, a very thick waxy layer, so they're not going to lose, lose as much moisture. And they're small, so there's less surface area for losing moisture. And uh, that is their sort of like uh, adaptations to the winter drought when things are and here we can see some of the uh, important uh, soil organisms, the, the fungi that are living in the soil, just like in the tropical rainforest. We have in the uh, temperate forest, we've got these, these um, uh, mycorrhizae that are associated with the roots of the plants that are helping bring nutrients out to the trees. The temperate deciduous forest, deciduous means they lose their leaves in the fall. So these are broadleaf trees that drop their leaves, relatively nutrient rich soils. And they typically, these deciduous forests have four different layers. There's the, the plants growing on the ground layer, like the, the uh, ferns and small um, herbaceous plants. Then you have a shrub layer, 
a layer of small trees that are sapling trees. These sapling trees are waiting for their opportunity to um, have an opening in the canopy. So the big canopy trees are taking up all the light and eventually one of them will blow over in a windstorm and the sapling can grow up and take advantage of that spot of light. There's a very rich diversity of plant and animal life. As you move further, further north from the deciduous forest, you get into a mixed forest and eventually you're into the taiga or the boreal forest, which is uh, only found in the northern hemisphere. There's no boreal forest found in the southern hemisphere. It covers about 11% of the Earth's land. These are vast forests um, across uh, Canada uh, and Eurasia. They have very thin soils. The soils are so thin because uh, at one point, um, the glaciers had wiped all the soils clean off of the rocks. And so the glaciers only melted about 10,000 years ago. And so there's been less time for soil development. Uh, the soils are acidic because when the, the pine, spruce and fir trees are dropping their needles, the needles contain a lot of uh, compounds that are uh, acidic in the soil. So when you go and you see the pine barrens in New Jersey, you'll see that the, the water there looks like a, a brown tea. It's an acidic tea and that's coming from the acidic soils there as well. And that's a little pocket of boreal forest in New Jersey. Um, and so they are tend to be very low in fertility. There's not like that a big fall uh, bounty of leaves bringing nutrients into the soil. They're generally dominated by evergreen conifers, but there are some broad leaf, broad leaf uh, deciduous species such as aspen found in them as well. Very high uh, densities of, of animals, especially in the summertime. And in general, people don't like to live in the boreal forest, the soils are poor for agriculture. The summers are very short for growing things and there tend to be a lot of uh, insects like mosquitoes and black flies. So here we can see um, a boreal forest and you can see all the yellow in this one. The yellow is the aspen and the aspen is a species of populace that will grow up after fire has gone through. So some of these boreal forests, especially in Western uh, North America, tend to have uh, quite frequent fires going through and uh, and then the aspen will grow up first. And then we can see uh, there's a lot of open water here. We've got these open water and boggy areas, which are basically places in the and the, and the rock that was scoured by the glaciers and left these little depressions with lots and lots of water in them. Um, this is obviously very important for a bird habitat, for migratory birds um, and insects. Uh, you can imagine that the number of mosquitoes breeding here might be rather large. What we're doing is we are logging this. There's not very many people living there to see, but we're logging it very rapidly. So the boreal forest um, is losing its um, beautiful, vast expanses. And, uh, and so uh, logging the trees, cutting them for, for uh, lumber and for paper um, has been clearing them. They just clear cut these, these uh, huge areas. And that is obviously going to affect the the species found there as well. Um, people have been living in the boreal forest. I, I don't want to make it sound like they, they haven't lived there. There's, uh, you know, European cultures in, the, in uh, Eurasia, uh, in Scandinavia, in Siberia of people that uh, lived within the, the boreal forest. And obviously Native Americans lived in the boreal forest as well. And uh, it's just the uh, European, uh, settlers and invaders in, in North America uh, chose not to spend as much time in the boreal forest because they were more used to more southern climes. When we look at where it's found then, we can see it is just in the northern hemisphere. Uh, so we have this really nice band of boreal forest uh, and uh, we can see that uh, in general, we look at the climate diagrams, the growing season is very short, so we've got uh, very long winters in the boreal forest with very short growing seasons. 
and uh, a fairly constant uh, precipitation, but what is extremely variable is going to be the temperature. From the very low winter temperatures, we can see we're going uh, below freezing for much of the much of the the uh, the year. So this would be your below freezing portion down here. So we got very long winters. There's the freezing point, and then here we got the freezing point right there. So we've got the temperatures are only above freezing here for about three months in Russia, in northern Russia. So they have harsh winters, lots of snow, dominated by coniferous trees, spruce, pine, firs, hemlocks, um, and they're able to um, uh, do a little bit of photosynthesis on summer day, or, uh, sorry, on sunny days in the winter. Uh, if you get a little little warm burst, they still have their little needles sitting there. They have a waxy cuticle for moisture. Soils are thin and acidic. These pine needles break down slowly because it's a cool climate. Some example animals, primarily seed eaters, insect eaters, or those that feel, feed on plants next to the water or in the water, like the moose. Squirrels, lots of squirrels, a lot of migratory birds that leave for the winter time. Elk, moose, deer, beaver, porcupine, grizzlies, wolves, wolverines, foxes, um, hares, rabbits. So the, um, what we'll start off with is a very quick review of the first part of the chapter, just in case it's been a while since you watched that uh, lecture. And then we will go over each of the following biomes, tropical forests, tropical savannas, deserts, woodlands and shrublands, which is also known as the chaparral or the Mediterranean woodland, um, temperate grasslands, temperate forests, the tundra, the mountaintops, and then I will touch on um, uh, some of the ways that the, that the biomes uh, or different ecosystems are structured in water. Chapter three covers life on wa in water. So I'm just going to uh, just quickly review that and then the uh, homework section. Okay, now we're in the beautiful tundra. Look at those, those uh, caribou. Uh, feasting on some lichens and plants growing north of the Arctic Circle. The tundra covers most of the land north of the Arctic Circle, so north of 60 degrees north. It is only found in the north. There is no tundra in the southern hemisphere. They're very cool, um, dry climate, very short summers. Uh, Precipitation is low, 200 to 600 millimeters of precipitation. Uh, very low rates of decomposition just because it's cold. When something dies, it just sort of lays on there and decomposes very slowly. There's a lot of different species that are found there, and uh, you can get very high numbers of them too. Uh, in general, people haven't lived, many people haven't lived in the tundra. There, there have obviously been uh, people living there uh, from uh, 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 native populations, uh, Aboriginal populations. But uh, now most people that are moving there are people that have been working on um, uh, oil and gas extraction, mining, and uh, and so it has increased as resources have become more difficult to find. Um, this is a looking at air view of a landscape in the tundra. You get these interesting landscapes. You get these bog areas and you get these polygons. And what happens is uh, in the brief short summer, the surface will melt, but it leaves ice underneath. Uh, so you get this un beneath the soil, you get this layer of permafrost. And then when the surface melts, you, you start, start to see it form these uh, little pond areas. And so we get uh, areas that have uh, lower amounts of vegetation surrounded by areas with larger amounts of vegetation. And you get these uh, really interesting polygon patterns in the surface. A lot of little wetlands will pop up then. It's very, very surface because the water won't drain away because of the permafrost underneath. Uh, 
as you can see we're very high north um, very high latitudes so we are um, across uh, we find this biome across uh, northern north america we've got it around the edge of greenland we're in iceland and then across eurasia and uh, it's a very widespread um, biome band across the across the north and we can see from each one of these climate diagrams we've got a very short period where the temperatures are above freezing no matter where you are and most of the most of the areas it's very low amounts of precipitation pretty constant all year but remember the pre precipitation for most of the year is going to be in the form of snow so we got snow forming here for most of the year even though the summers are short because of the tilt of the earth the summers have almost 24 hours of sunlight um that's 24 hours of daylight every day which means uh you you probably would have trouble sleeping there beneath the soil the soil will not thaw all the way down just the surface will thaw so you end up with a layer of permafrost ice down beneath the soil that means the soils on the surface as the snow melts become waterlogged and because it's relatively cold you don't get a lot of evaporation plants that are found there uh, there are some shrubs sedges grasses mosses and lichens lichens are a symbiote uh, lichens are a combination of algae and fungi living together tundra animals tend to be migratory they're moving around with the with the uh, plants that are becoming available and the carnivores are following the herbivores the uh, herbivores can include muskox caribou reindeer lemmings white foxes are some of your uh, or arctic foxes are some of your carnivores your snowy owls wolves it's the um tundra is found at the northernmost limits for plant growth you will also find um alpine tundra up on the mountain tops at high altitudes which we'll talk about the plants are generally uh, low growing they form a mat or a shrubby so the um what we'll start off with is a very quick review of the first part of the chapter just in case it's been a while since you watched that uh, lecture and then we will go over each of the following biomes tropical forests tropical savannas deserts woodlands and shrublands which is also known as the chaparral or the mediterranean woodland um, temperate grasslands temperate forests the tundra the mountaintops and then i will touch on um, uh, some of the ways that the, that the biomes uh, or different ecosystems are structured in water chapter three covers life on wa in water so i'm just going to uh, just quickly review that and then the uh, homework section so you can see that we have a, a few little spots here where there's some shrubs but other than that it's uh, pretty much mosses and lichens and low growing plants um, but then um, in the mountains and the mountain tops we can find uh, basically an, an alpine tundra that is growing up at high altitudes it's not not just in the the arctic but you get this alpine tundra as well and the alpines um, the mountains are uh, an amazing amount of diversity because they're scattered basically at the, the top altitudes of biomes all around the world so mountains make little islands of of tundra arctic tundra or sorry alpine tundra up in the sky they are um, often found in areas where you have geologic activity mountain building is occurring as as tectonic plates are colliding the climate changes as you go up in elevation and uh, so we find that the climate changes uh, you could be at the same elevation on different mountains but if you're at different latitudes as well is obviously going to be differ different depending on how far north you are 
The soils tend to be well drained in the alpine tundra uh, and rather thin. So because of the slopes, the water is going to just rush downhill. Uh, it's going to be, tend to be a rocky soil as opposed to a boggy soil. And we find that the plants, the flora, and the animals, the fauna, will change as you go up the mountain. Historically, we use them for raw materials. We use them for mining uh, because the soils are not good for um, doing any sort of agriculture. But you can also, you know, there are communities that have traditionally lived up in mountain areas for uh, seasonal livestock grazing. So here we're in the tropics. We're in the tropical savanna. And then you look at here and we've got Mount Kilimanjaro. And so up at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, you get to a point up here where you're above the tree line. So from this point on, you're such a high elevation that you cannot grow any trees in this area. And then we get to a spot in Kilimanjaro even higher than that where it keeps snow and ice year round and that that you have a an area up there of of glaciers now what we're finding with climate change um, is that uh, these mountains are getting warmer and it's changing those uh, biome locations and these boundaries are adjusting with that so the trees are moving up the sides of the mountains now with climate change and also with climate change we're finding that these ice caps are starting to disappear so you can see take a look at this picture of mount kilimanjaro from a few years ago and then currently you can see mount kilimanjaro has lost most of its glaciers the ice has disappeared off of the top of mount kilimanjaro so these biomes there's a rapid change of ecosystems as you go up these mountains going from tropical up into um, very cold ones, but we're also finding that they are changing rapidly, one of the first signs of climate change. The problem with losing these glaciers up on the top of the mountains is that, that right, melting water every summer from those glaciers um, in mountain ranges has been the source of uh, water for many of the communities living downhill. Alpine tundra, tundra is found at high elevations. You can find high enough mountains at all latitudes. Um, unlike the Arctic tundra, the daylight here is going to be variable depending on your latitude, but there's still a lot of the same restrictions that you find with uh, growing there as you find with the Arctic tundra. So you look at where you find these mountain ranges and we can see in general the mountain ranges in North America because of the movement of the tectonic plates um, in North America, the plates are colliding here and we've got these um, mountains forming in north-south uh, directions across North America and South America. And then when we look in Europe and Asia, like the this plate, is colliding with uh, Eurasia and forming the mountains um, right across here. The Himalayas are being formed. And so we find the mountains in Europe and Asia generally go east and west. And these areas where you have all these little mountains, it's going to be a completely different biome on those mountaintops than you found in the surrounding areas. So the um, what we'll start off with is a very quick review of the first part of the chapter, just in case it's been a while since you watched that uh, lecture. And then we will go over each of the following biomes, tropical forests, tropical savannas, deserts, woodlands and shrublands, which is also known as the chaparral or the Mediterranean woodland, um, temperate grasslands, temperate forests, the tundra, the mountaintops, and then I will touch on um, uh, some of the ways that the, that the biomes uh, or different ecosystems are structured in water. Chapter three covers life on wa in water. So I'm just going to uh, just quickly review that and then the uh, homework section. So that is the biomes covered in chapter two. Chapter three talks about 
life and water and i i don't have a separate lecture on that chapter um but when we look at uh trying to uh, classify things we obviously have a very terrestrial perspective because we're a terrestrial animal but 90 70 percent of the planet is is covered in water and there's a lot of species found in there so uh there's like 250,000 species uh known to live in the marine environment and more are likely to be discovered so we're still discovering new ecosystems and new species um when life evolved in water, it has the uh, physical and chemical properties to, to be a really uh, easy place to live. It's got a stable temperature. Uh, you have buoyancy, uh, so you're able to keep your place in the water column. Um, and what we find the selective forces in aquatic systems to be very different than what we find in terrestrial systems. So they operate very differently. Aquatic biomes are classified based on their physical characteristics um, as opposed to the uh, terrestrial ones being placed, classified based on their dominant plants. The aquatic ones are, are based on the, the abiotic environment. Things like salinity and water movement, salt water versus fresh water, lentic or low tick So some of the the um, water systems or aquatic systems we're probably more familiar with being terrestrial animals is looking at the lakes and ponds which are fresh waters and uh, there when you go deep in the water you find significant differences in community structure as you get down into the uh from the photic zone where you have lots of light down into the uh darker water so a lot of uh, phytoplankton so little floating algae and floating little tiny animals the zooplankton are found up in that light zone and then when you get down into the aphotic zone the dark zone you're going to find the dead things will fall the detritus is down there and the there are also moving fresh waters, which um, we find the, the streams and rivers. So we find that there's a zonation from, from being upstream with these small streams down to these uh, broad, wide, um, relatively flat rivers that move much more slowly as you get downstream. And uh, we find that the, the physical characteristics and the chemical characteristics change, which means you have different um, organisms living in those two different types of, of moving fresh waters. Um, it changes the algae, it changes what's living on the bottom, it changes what fish you have. And then there's marine systems. Three quarters of the world's surface is uh, covered in salt water, has an impact on climate, on wind patterns, and the algae floating in that water, the single cell plants, the algae, are supplying most of the world's oxygen. When we look in marine systems, then we can see there's obviously going to be differences depending on whether you're close to the continents on the continental shelf or whether you're down um, in the, the slope where it falls off rapidly, whether you're in a sub subduction zone where the plates are, are colliding uh, or a deep sea trench where the plates are spreading apart, where you've got lots of volcanic activity. Obviously, it's different if you're up here where you've got lots of light coming in versus down here where it's dark. So there's a lot of different physical characteristics when you're in a marine system. So when we go from the top of the surface of the water down into the deep water, you've got vertical changes. But then when you're going from uh, the coast where you've got the tides coming in and out down to the oceanic zones, you've got horizontal uh, changes in the system. So the intertidal area where it gets dried out between the tides then we've got the uh, shallow areas, the neuritic areas, which are on the continental shelves. And then we go out in the oceanic areas where you've got the deeper zones. When you've got open water communities, that's the pelagic community, but then you've got things living on the bottom. And any, any aquatic system, marine system, where you have things living on the bottom, that the, the sea floor, the lake floor, that's the benthic community. When we get down deep in the ocean, you've got cold water, very high pressure, and no light, and yet we still find organisms living. So we look at these deep sea fishes, 
with their little lures that will fluoresce so that it'll attract something to eat. One important ecosystem that is on the boundary between terrestrial ecosystems and uh, aquatic ecosystems are estuaries. This is where the freshwater rivers um, pour into the oceans, but the tidal uh, movement of salt water back up into the estuaries bring nutrients there. So you're washing nutrients off the land, into the rivers, into the ocean, very high numbers of nutrients. So these estuaries tend to be some of the most um, productive in the world. There's not very, they're not very diverse. There's not a lot of species tolerant of the salinity of the salt water coming in, but they do grow very well. Um, and then because of the growth of the algae and the plants, you get lots of animals living there, oysters, crabs, fish, and then the birds will come in and feed on those. Uh, and these are areas that are really in danger from water pollution, for the, from us polluting the fresh water on the land. So the, um, what we'll start off with is a very quick review of the first part of the chapter, just in case it's been a while since you watched that. Uh, lecture and then we will go over each of the following biomes tropical forests tropical savannas deserts woodlands and shrublands which is also known as the chaparral or the mediterranean woodland um, temperate grasslands temperate forests the tundra the mountaintops and then i will touch on um, uh, some of the ways that the, that the biomes uh, or different ecosystems are structured in water. Chapter three covers life on wa in water. So I'm just gonna uh, just quickly review that and then the uh, homework section. So for your um, looking through the, the different biomes, there's a, we already covered in the other um, presentation uh, the earlier parts of the chapter and now you're into these biomes for each biome you should be able to explain how the traits of the plants and the traits of the animals um, uh, can function in that different environment and uh, and how they affect the other organisms in the environment so this was uh, section 2.3 of your textbook so at the end of section 2.3 there are a couple of concept review questions. The first one is why do these regions, whether tropical, desert, or temperate, that include high mountains, tend to be the most biologically diverse? You should be able to answer that question thoroughly. And number two, why would the soils in tropical rainforests generally be depleted of their nutrients more rapidly compared to the nutrients in temperate forest soils? So there's something special about the soils in every single biome. And uh, you should be able to explain how these soils are functioning differently. Then there are the review questions that cover the whole chapter at the back, which includes some specifically on the biomes. And uh, don't forget to uh, read Appendix A. Moving ahead, the next presentation is going to be on Chapter 5, which is on temperature relations. And uh, the investigating the evidence we'll do then is going to be investigating the evidence five, which is on lab experiments. See you then. So the um, what we'll start off with is a very quick review of the first part of the chapter, just in case it's been a while since you watched that uh, lecture. And then we will go over each of the following biomes, tropical forests, tropical savannas, deserts, woodlands and shrublands, which is also known as the chaparral or the Mediterranean woodland, um, temperate grasslands, temperate forests, the tundra, the mountaintops. And then I will touch on um, uh, some of the ways that the, that the biomes uh, or different ecosystems are structured in water. Chapter three covers life on wa in water. So I'm just gonna uh, just quickly review that and then the uh, homework section.